I should say that um, Agnes Varda is working on a new film, and that's why she can't be here. Otherwise, she would have come. But I think it's a, it's a good excuse. You know, she's she's making a new film, and who knows? You know, maybe we will see each other again here next year, in this cinema with the new work um, on screen. Um, she also made uh, a sequel to this one, which you can see on YouTube, where she um, talks to the Glaner again um, about their life and um, their practice as, as gleaners and also about her own film. So it's like, again, reflecting back on, on her own practice, which, which she's been doing in this film. If you notice, the title is Les Glaneurs et la Glaneuse. So it's about the people she's filming and it's about herself. Um, the people who are, who are uh, rummaging, uh, collecting the, the, the food, the vegetable, the kind of discarded, the waste, these things that you know f you can't use anymore for, uh, say, in industrial production. And herself is doing the same thing with her camera. She's also looking at those people who are marginal, who are being left out of mainstream society, who are maybe not successful in what we call success, being successful in your life, career-wise. Uh, and, and also there's a kind of, always an imminent um, um, uh, reference to death and aging. So herself also, she feels, um, you know, she's being, she's being the one who is being discarded. But she loves this, of course, you know, the way in which she picks up the heart-shaped potato and films it and puts it into a place to look at is is something that I have to say I just feel uh, sometimes we we are losing in this society you know to look at this kind of very human and normal lives that uh, are not just dictated by the desire of um, making money or fitting into a certain category I get quite nostalgic when I look at a film in terms of ethics, in terms of content, and also formally how she edits the film. And, and um, it's a very, very touching film. Um, but I wanted to make this uh, relationship between uh, Toilets Not Temples and, the, and Agnes Wada film because of the implication of the filmmaker. Agnes Wada implicates herself, as I just said, through, a, through an autoportrait, really directly. It's very obvious. Uh, she films herself, and it's in the title. You also implicate yourself in 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 the story, in the narrative, and in the politics, like so, let's say, of your film, but in a much more subtle way. Um, but you're not making, you're not starting out to produce a certain truth. You're mocking the very means of production, the very languages that are usually used. Uh, F f in the production of these kind of journalistic films. So, and we talked about this a little bit before and talked a little bit about the ethics in this film. So could you maybe expand on that a little bit? Will, Benedict and David Leonard, I would like to hear from you both, mm -hmm. if possible. You've got the mics closer to you. <laughs> 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 Well, you're a much more ethical man than I am. I'm just kidding, actually. Um, so the ethics of film, I mean, the implications, the implications of the ethics um, of, of myself. <laughs> um, well, Will was really interested in sort of this idea of the um, unreliable narrator. You kept saying I'm the unreliable narrator, which I don't prescribe to so much, believe it or not. Um, <laughs> I thought I was very reliable. Um, <laughs> because in these movies, you know, the mechanism that carries this story um, always has a kind of uh, language. I mean, watching this, we both have hip hop. I mean, it's actually amazing yes. Yes. how much there is a similarity in these two films uh, stylistically, although um, we have CGI and she doesn't. So, and thanks. <laughs> we'll we'll put that part together. But I think this idea of um, of ethics, in some way, at this point in time, is uh, making the 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 system not only a food production and food 
waste uh, part of the film, but also making the cinematic waste and the sort of cinematic, um, the, the, the construction of itself allows people hopefully to see the, um, the sort of illusion or the, the spectacle of the thing itself. And so in some ways, um, telling a fib is more honest than telling the truth if that makes sense, in this kind of media making. But um, I'll pass that on to you. Which is, so con- uh, which is so contrasty to the Agnes Varda film. I mean, that's what, it, it, that's a, you know, a movie we know from school or something. It's something we got taught early on, that wonderful film that we just watched. And um, yeah, the contrast is, is stark. Uh, what you brought up that that the tenderness of Miss Varda's film and um, yeah sorry that's just where I needed to take it <laughs> that, that contrast is is very intense to watch it there I, I clearly obviously haven't I mean seeing those two put together like that it's I'm a bit shocked by mm. the passage of time mm. and that clock with no hands mm. And 2015 is very different from 2000. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, they were different, but I, I will talk about another parallel that I found. Is that both films, in a way, are travelogues, and that, yes, they take the, the, take the spectator and the audience on a journey through France and from Bergen to, to India. Um, but also the the way in which the films are narrated are kind of fl- flanneristic. Uh, with Agnes Varda, of course, she takes up little stories and develops them further. So someone is talking about um, uh, the, the guy in the bar is talking about a catastrophe, and then the cut goes to the birds who are soaked in oil, o- on, and things like that. So she takes clues, and then she she takes them seriously and she develops them. But at the same time, her flaneuring in the narrative always comes back to les glaneurs et la glaneuse, to very specific topic. So it's kind of like contained and framed. And your film is much more open. You, you also flaneur, you take us on a route and then we totally lose you whether that's in the language, because y- the way in which you, you play with journalistic language is just impossible to follow. The sentences are too long. The, the, the technical jargon is too complicated for my brain to, to understand before I know we're already later further on in the sentence. So, so we're kind of losing track of where you're going. So, so you're, you're also flaneuring, but it's much more really losing losing oneself in the narrative. You're not coming back. It doesn't really loop back to a, to a, to a structure or a kind of web of concepts. Yeah, I mean, but, but in some ways, the stylistic um, things, the sort of like, um, like the stand-ups are important, like where, you know, I'm constructing this, like w- this idea of like showing the outtakes and the outtake becomes a sort of thread more important, I think, than even the language of this. You know, while we were making this movie, Will was doing a lot of Instagramming. And I think about this idea in some way of, of like self-selection that happens in, in Instagram or in like our social media out where we try and eliminate the, the ugly parts you know, and we, we sort of feature the best of ourselves. And in some ways, I thought this idea of exposing the kind of um, the, the outtake was uh, as important an idea of, as, as the language itself. And the language just becomes a carrier. So the, the stylistic cinematic trope of, of that actually is in some ways carrying you through to the ending um, this is an important part of documentary filmmaking, right? Outside the frame. That's what he just said. Expand on that word. It's what I try to do in general in my work, but that's hard to expand upon. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Really? Try for us, Will. Okay. Well, 
I mean, for me, the, the thing is that we have to stand on the ground, and that's painful. <laughs> and then um, from, from there, like, shit, capitalism. <laughs> and um, then uh, how we're going to communicate, and then, um, yeah. Isn't that about it? <laughs> we got to eat. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. So basics, basically. Yeah. You just hand me the microphone if you cool. don't want to talk anymore. <laughs> about the basics, I'm not like, going to let you go with that. Yeah, <laughs> don't Yeah, because Will is making really, really interesting tableaus, could we call it? Yeah. Always with a plate with food on it in the background not always often oh. okay often no, it's so confusing. and people sitting yeah. in front of it real people that you photograph yeah. and discuss or something like that yeah. very absurd the sometimes the the plates in the backgrounds are painted very absurd and 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 very very basic and that's what i said in my introduction the reason why i'm interested in food and food politics is because it concerns us on a daily level, but it's so basic that we oversee it. Yet it has so many ramifications, so many parallel lives in, in picking up that potato or putting that butter on it. Yes, yeah. My water is called silence. I mean, my water is literally called silence. How did we get there? <laughs> um, yeah, I wanted to talk a bit more about food, as in, you know, why does it concern you? Where do you see these issues played out in? contemporary art or in journalism. You, David, you're an artist and a journalist. Uh, you, you, you dance in, on both weddings, as we say. <laughs> uh, but rarely do I get invited to weddings. <laughs> Sometimes, though. Will, Will is really a painter. I mean, you, yeah, you're a painter. Um, so, so you come across these issues that you explore in the film in your work as a journalist, first of all, and then you take them further, sometimes in col collaborations like this one. But for you, food is really the, the, the red thread of your paintings. Uh, well, the, this, this idea that, that we consume in general, so food being a, a basic. tell you uh, two microphones is a problem <laughs> but that's kind of like that's yeah kind of what i'm into <laughs> the the problem of the yeah like and, and one's red yeah it's true it, it could be rudolph <laughs> <laughs> <Quite easily. laughs> um we were talking about the journalistic food thread and rudolph um yeah, I mean, in journalism, I mean, we, I was in Florida for a while. And Florida is, you know, I live in California. I worked in, in Florida, which is the kind of bread baskets of America. Um, and Florida has this long tradition of, of migrant workers that um, uh, poor labor practices, et cetera. Uh, that, and when we made this movie, um, one of the things that I was strangely thinking about was a movie by... Um, Edward R. Murrow, who was a CBS journalist, uh, Good Night and Good Luck. He was a kind of a, in the, if we think about ideals in the world of journalism, I would put him, you know, and Agnes in this way that they were championing real ideas. And not only that, the performance, I think, of journalism. So uh, in, a, in the Harvest of Shame, um, they played in 1960, the day after Thanksgiving, they made they played on CBS to millions of viewers 
um, this documentary about how their food was delivered to them. And so there was this implication of the audience on television and that the journalist was, was a, a performer and that there was actually a, a situation that they could change and, and kind of um, create um, a kind of awareness. And, and food in itself, following money, following food, following blood, following whatever money, all these things we follow in journalism, food is a, is a, is a really great kind of uh, thread, I guess, to follow. So I was as interested in the following as I was the food in itself. Um, you know, any excuse to get out of the house. And um, and the language you're using, I, I really like the way in which you play on the journalistic, you know, way of speaking the tone. And for me, this is a gen more general concern also in the arts, the way in which we adopt a really quick fix, almost corporate um, neoliberal language to talk about contemporary art if it's you know emerging artists and fresh work and there's an in german for those who speak german this is a new one i love it spannend yeah everything is spannend so <laughs> yeah you know what i mean <laughs> um and and of course the meaning gets lost in, in the application of that kind of uh as very you know superficial language um, was that a concern for you in the film? Was that language on all levels, or if it's journalistic, or if it's the kind of formal language that gets repeated so many times, it's losing its content? Content is that something that concerns you, and you in general? Thanks. <laughs> um, I think something that's always tripping me out is that we have a word called moral, and then we have a word called ethical, and. It's very strange that we would have two words kind of covering the same territory. And one has a kind of religious overtones and the other one has secular overtones, maybe legalistic um, overtones, something like that. And all that nitpicking about language is really, I think, kind of all we have um, to and decipher the psychosis that we're all kind of undergoing. So, so language, yes. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. Let's see if um, we have questions or comments from, from the audience about the program, the combination of films, both artists sitting here with me, of course, general concerns. I would like to know what made you come to a program with this title, Food in Chains, because as I say, I'm trying to explore a little bit uh, the, the topic of food in contemporary art. It's very evasive, so yes, we have a question there, and there's a microphone coming, because we're recording this. This is our third microphone, by the way. Hi, my name is Anders Modig, and I'm a journalist, and also I used to be a chef, so that's mm -hmm. why I'm here. But also what I find very interesting in the films, and also if we look at now the fantastic installation on Messeplatz and so on, is that it's so much talk about the distribution and the unfairness in the chain, and also about the ritual, the meeting, but there is very little talk about flavor. Where is flavor in the food in contemporary art? That's very specific, and it's a good question. <laughs> Um, what made you think about flavor? What made you? He's think? into it. Yeah. yeah, I love it. And as a former chef who's now into journalism, I just f saw that everything was coming together this week. <laughs> mm -hmm. what, what's that? What's that restaurant that was really big before the financial crisis in Spain? B Bully, El Bully. So. That was like the restaurant before the financial crisis, right? And then it had a kind of aesthetic. And I never ate there, so I don't know what the flavor of the food was, actually. But there's like ideas attached to it. It seems like that's kind of what 
matters. But I, I live in Paris, so I mean, I understand your concerns or something like that. I hang out with a lot of, you know, like wine critics, and they're very interesting people, very precise, you know, exceptional with their, their descriptions and their adverbs and their adjectives, and really trying to get to what like a thing is through language. It's phenomenal practice. It's unbelievable. They it can irritate the shit out of me. But I, I like some of them a lot, actually. And um, so, but then after the financial crisis, there was like a, like a shift. Kinda. I mean, Greece is about to leave the euro. Yikes. And um, so then we went to Denmark, right? So we went to Noma. And like watching that Agnes Varda film and Noma and everything and like, that guy from Noma is going to go to Hong Kong and he's going to forage. He's going to glean. There's not much to glean in Hong Kong. There's not much to, to find. You know, there's some kind of some weeds and like in between the cracks of the sidewalk and you can walk up a hill and so I'm going to show you where there's like a, like a fish and like a little thing. And so we're marketing all of that flavors, I guess. But for me, that it's just, it's just culturally impacted. I'm really excited about IBM's Watson. <laughs> Has anyone been following Watson, the cognitive computing system? So IBM is sort of trying to make this sort of you put information in and it spits out. And it's been working on uh, these, these recipes and so it pulls from these foods that we would never mix together because it's thinking about um, kind of more more flavor sets. And then I know this biologist who's been trying to, who's been making human cheese from armpit sweat. And so I think you know that is actually sort of part of the aesthetic component of what's going on in terms of the sort of like the this kind of it's like yeah it's it's silence but it's also something um like way more uh, binary that's happening to our taste buds and the flavors around us it's like we were talking about hershey earlier hershey is now going they originally started like your Hershey Kisses started as natural, then they became unnatural, and now they're trying to get back to natural ingredients. So there's this kind of journey that that the that the chocolate bar is going under to sort of meet our 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 desire for natural flavors, but they can't do it because the vanilla, for instance, has variable crops. And so there's a conundrum. And then there's also the... Standardization is off. Standardization. And then there's also... They just put a little exclaimer that says, this is a handmade product. Yeah, or a barn. You just put a barn on the box. And then you go, oh, yeah, I like that. I like a barn on the box. <laughs> now I'm going to answer, answer your question because I don't know these two. <laughs> <laughs> The answer to your question is, where is the taste in contemporary art, I think? Because contemporary art, at the end of the day, is visual. And the sense of taste, it's not easy to represent visually, whereas ritual and politics around food is, you know, and the art world also becomes more and more intellectualized. So I think that's why taste is difficult to deal with or represent in, in contemporary art. But it's 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 in negativo there in all the food programs on television, you know that's been you know literally mushrooming our television screens from the Master Chef in England and Australia. I think that works so well because every time we see these people eating or from these amazing plates, we have to imagine the taste, and so that produces a kind of game of desire between what we see and what we taste or what we want to taste. And it's a very interesting sensory psychological setup and that's why 
they work so well and they work over decades, you know, they were now over 10 years old, these food programs. Yes, we have one question here, the lady over there, and after that, the, the gentleman in the middle. Hi, my name is Isabel de Rigo, and I have no questions, but in terms of why I'm here, it's because I'm uh, uh, in the art, the contemporary art. I'm working on a project, um, art project called Taste Your Taste, and it's about um, uh, organizing dinner, uh, in a way of a performance where we are inviting people to experiment the food with the five senses. So um, it's like if the people, they are coming to a dinner, but at the same time they are making a performance for themselves, facing the first way of survival, which is eating, right? Which is very emotional also. So it's true that food is very present in the contemporary art. And so that's my project. And where do you do this? In Geneva. In Geneva. Oh. Tasteyourstaste.ch. Mm -hmm. Did you just plug your thing? She did. I like that. That was awesome. Yeah, that was she plug what? You just plugged your thing. They don't know. <laughs> well, you don't know about plugging? You just did it. Yeah. Did it. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I just make, uh, I mean, um, publicity. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Yay. That was good. Oh. Sorry. No, he, he likes that kind of thing. That's his, that's his thing. Yeah. yeah. Can you just pass on the mic? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was taste with a. What was the. It was taste.com. Now, what was it? Taste your taste. Taste your taste. <laughs> Sounds like my email address. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hello. Uh, my name is Matt McCarthy. Um, I'm interested in filmmaking generally, and I'm also interested in a lot of related topics about how we contextualize information and how media is created and how narratives are created and all that. And what I'm thinking about now is sort of a through line between both films and and sort of some of the things that have come up in this conversation is a, a kind of dynamic tension between an urge for uniformity or consistency and an urge for uniqueness or distinction. And you know, when you see Agnes Varga picking out the heart-shaped potatoes and sort of treasuring that uniqueness that the commercial world casts aside, I think that there's an odd parallel with your sort of heightened absurdity of the journalistic world and the fact that there's there's a sort of speech pattern and a sort of semiotic system in which we're now used to receiving information. And so at the, on the one hand, you have um, major media figures sort of seeking out what is new and unique and current, and, and it doesn't really matter ultimately if it's a meaningless celebrity scandal or you know a rising ocean, because it's all presented with the same semiotic framework. And I think that, you know, it just strikes me that that's kind of that that tension between those two impulses is really present in both of these films in different ways. Yes. I mean, from a sort of professional, uh, like making of the news. Um, yeah, I mean, I. I think the reason Will asked me to do this is because he knew that I could make it in a short period of time. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> like he had all it. He's like, "Well, we can get it done," um, because at some point I was making five stories a week. So every day I would make a story, about three to five minutes. I would shoot, write, edit, and for a news, a local news station. Um, and at one point, I started to get Mad Libs. You know, so I would have like a grisly discovery on blank street, you know, and then I had, you know, a family, um, you know, a family awoke, you know, to a, a disturbing sound. It decided it turned out to be what, you know, what was that disturbing sound? And you could just plug in what that was, uh, you know, a, an explosion from a, a speed you know, manufacturing trailer or, uh, you know, whatever those things are. So I think in it's part of production, the same way we do food, we do journalism. And so we start having this repetition on um, the content just sort of fills in those blank spots. Painting. 
painting. Um, and, uh, and, and then, you know, you're also thinking about an audience. What is the audience for news? The new, they're, they're sitting, you know, they come home, um, you know, they're making dinner, you're making dinner, you're doing these things and, and the news just sort of comes on as a sort of background track and your audience is then, you know, you're hoping to kind of, it's, I think the unique moment that you're sort of delivering in this thing that you're hoping will then grab them from what they are doing. So they're sort of, okay, I'm doing this, I'm get cleaning up, I'm getting ready, I'm taking care of the kids, I'm doing this. And then you hear that moment that makes them, and it's usually led by the ear and then the eye, so that, you know, they, they break apart. Um, so I don't know if that kind of answers, but I think that it's the mode of production that just creates this, the, 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 the deadline it's the deadline and the sort of desire for more content that creates the thing to happen to to do the, to make the same thing over and over and over. Or pretend that it's good. Right. It's the pretend, and it's also the selling of the new within the old. You know, you're like, me I did medical miracles. You know, like, uh, you know, you wouldn't believe this new gizmo that they put in this person's back could make them walk and carry hundreds of pounds. Watch the 70 year old woman, you know, carry, uh, you know, push, you know, move a car off her grandson, you know, whatever it is. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, <laughs> but your ad libs are weird. <laughs> yeah. Because I'm in, you know, I'm in Switzerland. <laughs> um, so, but I think, that gets to it, kind of. Um. Just a quick add-on, because you talked about the semiotic system in which you deliver and we receive the news. So we're talking about a kind of methodology, the methodology through which we, we shoot the data. And they are trying, in a way, to critique the, this methodology by intensifying it, so rendering it absurd. Agnes Wader is still of the generation who could, in a way, really change it, you know? And I think now, with everything that's going on in the world, we are really desperately trying to find another, in a way, real radical shift in the methodology. We've come so far as pushing it as far as we can so that we're still getting some something out of it, some kind of critique out of it. But I think, I mean, our whole generation is just trying to find, I'll give you the mic in no, a second. No, I realize what you said, it's interesting. Uh, I'm trying to find a new method, a new methodology, which is the language. That's why I'm so interested in language, a new language. I think it will come, you know, it must come. But we're in this weird, almost cul-de-sac where, you know, we, we have to go through this thin tunnel to, to, to find another language on the other side. I hope I'll still live when, when we find it. I mean, I just, I just want to say to something that Agnes Varda is trying to change the thing. I think this is essentially, you know, man with a movie camera uh, in some way, that she's actually remaking a man with a movie camera in, in 2000, and that there's actually an awareness of the kind of repetition, but that's just that there's actually, while she, she might've changed things in her, in the sort of sixties, but then I think in this film, she's accepting the sort of inability to change, but that's mm -hmm. just me thinking about it. Let's see any more. Echoes. <laughs> Do you want to say last word? You're Thanks. taking in breath. <laughs> no, 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 I'm done. I, just, I mean, I feel I'm sort of embarrassed, like even challenge. You're so smart. And I'm just, and I'm just like, I just like feel like I said something. And I was like, oh my God, I just said that. <laughs> I just want to amplify my laughter right now. <laughs> Maybe that's a good point too to move on to the foyer, continue the conversation outside. Thank you very much for coming and we'll see you outside. Thank you. Thank you.